Hi, and welcome to this lesson on the commercial applications of electrochemical cells. Our key learning objectives, we're going to be looking at non-rechargeable batteries, rechargeable batteries, and then taking a look at hydrogen fuel cells. So electrochemical cells, they're used in making batteries. And the overall EMF, the electromotive force, or sometimes called the cell potential of the cell, gives an indication as to how effective that battery is. So in batteries, electrons move from the oxidation flow through an external circuit where they can do work and they can transfer energy. We've got our three main types of cells. Those are fuel cells, and we'll look at those last. Then we've got rechargeable, and then we've also got non-rechargeable. All non-rechargeable batteries work on the principle that one species is more easily oxidised than the other. And the voltage of non-rechargeable batteries can be worked by calculating the difference between the standard electropotentials or the electropotentials of each half cell, as we learned in the previous lesson. And we can use these batteries, non-rechargeable batteries, for all sorts of things. We've got torches, watches, toys and electronic equipment. Here's a practice question to have a go at. Pause the video to give it a go yourself or wait for my worked example. So here I can identify that the manganate reaction has got the more positive standard electropotential. So the reaction is going to occur in the forward reaction. We're going to have reduction happening there. But the zinc with the less positive, we're going to have the backwards reaction. We're going to have oxidation happening there. So if I write those out, we've got our reaction at the manganate is going to be this. I'm literally writing out as it's presented in the table. But then at the zinc, we're going to have oxidation happening. In order to calculate my EMF, remember, it's my more positive minus my more negative. So I'm going to take my manganate, so 1.23 minus my more negative, 0 0.76. And that's going to give me an EMF of 1.99 volts. Finally, I'm going to need to add my two equations. So we've already established that this is going to be my forward, but the zinc one, I'm going to rewrite that backwards just here for my reference and I need to add this equation and this equation together. Now you need to spot the fact that we've got only one electron for my manganate but I've got two electrons here for my zinc so I need to times my manganate equation by two and then add the two equations together. So I'm then going to have 2MnO2 plus 2H2O plus 2e minus is plus, of course, my reactants here. So plus Zn is going to give me 2MnO plus 2OH minus plus my reactants here, which aren't going to be doubled. Zn2 plus plus 2e minus. And my electrons cancel out. Check whether anything else cancels out. It doesn't. And then you can write your overall equation underneath. There we go. And we've answered all parts. We've got the overall reaction. We've got reactions that are actually occurring and the overall EMF. Looking at the pros and cons of non-rechargeable batteries. So we've got some advantages here. They are cheaper, they are easy to use, as I'm sure you've experienced. They're portable, very easily to replace, and there's a wide range of applications. When we're looking at some of the disadvantages, we've got once the reactants have been used up, the battery must be disposed of. And sometimes that could be complicated. We aren't always able to put them into our household waste. The casing of the battery can be corroded by an electrolyte causing leakages. Some of you may have experienced this before. You've got to be really, really careful. It's not sustainable. And toxic chemicals can leach from landfill sites and into water sources. Let's take a look at rechargeable batteries. So rechargeable batteries are based on reversible reactions. So here we've got a lithium example. So 
So there's one of our recharge, uh, reversible and the standard electrode potential there. is minus 3.04 volts and on our other side And that has a standard electro potential of plus 0 0.36 volts. So you can see it's quite a big difference between these two values. So when the battery is being charged, the reverse reactions occur to the above. Okay? And the electrons flow in the opposite direction from the electricity supply to the lithium ions. And that means that you can then reuse the battery after it's been recharged. So check your specification carefully. On your specification, it might be that you need to learn the reactions of the lithium ion battery by heart, and you may well need to know all of those details. Let's look at rechargeable batteries. We've got pros and cons here as well. So they've got a longer lifespan than non-rechargeable, of course, you can recharge them. So things like electric toothbrushes, our phones, they can be recharged hundreds of times. Some last longer on a single charge than non-rechargeable batteries. And also they are more energy efficient as charging takes less energy than making new batteries. But of course, there are some cons as well. They often cost more than non-rechargeable batteries. They do need to be regularly charged and not all appliances are suitable to be used with rechargeable batteries. You also do get degradation over time, just like with non-rechargeable. Rechargeable batteries will degrade and they do need to be replaced, but they do last a lot longer, of course, than non-rechargeable. Our final type of cell is our hydrogen fuel cells. So fuel cells can produce electricity by using fuel. And hydrogen fuel cell, as an example, it uses hydrogen on the positive electrode and it uses an oxidant on the negative electrode. And they can be used to run cars and vehicles. And as long as you've got a constant supply of fuel, then the cells can operate continuously as long as you keep supplying it. And fuel cells can also use an acidic electrolyte, for example. Let's take a look at an alkaline fuel cell. So hydrogen fuel cells can be acid or alkaline. And check your specification carefully. Some require you to learn these equations. Some require you just to be familiar with them. So in a alkaline hydrogen oxygen fuel cell, we've got various reactions happening. So we might have 2H2 gaseous 4OH minus, and that gives us water. So nothing too nasty being produced there. And then we've got oxygen at the oxygen electrode. This is what's happening. So I've just shown you what happens at the hydrogen electrode. At the oxygen electrode, we are going to have the reduction happening. So 4OH minus. So here we've got our oxidation. Here we've got our reduction. And therefore we can get an overall equation, which is going to be 2H2 plus O2, and that gives us 2H2O. Okay, so it's actually not got any particularly disastrous products being formed in that particular case, which makes it uh, very appealing. If we look at our standard electro potentials, they're a little bit sticky, uh, tricky to fit in here. But for our first reaction, our standard electro potential was zero minus 0 0.83 volts. And for our one below, it's plus 0 0.40 volts. So our overall EMF, our more positive minus our less positive, is plus 1.23 volts. How do hydrogen fuel cells work? On some specifications, you need to have quite a detailed understanding of what's going on here. Like I said before, check the level of understanding they require. So here we've got our hydrogen entering at the negative electrode, and we can see they're releasing electrons and the electrons flow through the external circuit where they do their work and they transfer their energy. The electrons then enter into the positive electrode and this is where we've got oxygen entering. Okay, so electrons are then accepted at that electrode and that was the equation we saw earlier that was happening at the oxygen electrode. They are accepting the electrons. 
giving us 4OH minus. It's called an alkaline fuel cell. Hopefully you've spotted that. OH minus, alkaline fuel cell. Then the OH minus is going to travel through the semi-permeable membrane where oxidation is going to occur. So over here, they're then going to drop those off. And that's going to be now at the hydrogen electrode. So we've got those four OH minuses that have travelled and they're dropping those electrons back off, hence the oxidation. Oxidation is loss. So what happens to the H plus? Well, we've got hydrogen entering at the negative electrode, releasing electrons, and they're flowing through the circuit and they're doing their work. Then they're going to come into the other electrode, our positive electrode, and we've got oxygen entering. And then we've got our H plus moving through a semi-permeable membrane. And we're going to have water forming at the cathode in this reaction. So we're going to have O2 with those protons picking up the electrons. So reducing and forming water. Hydrogen fuel cells, they've got a lot of advantages to them. So they can produce electricity and enough of it to run vehicles, which are lighter and smaller. They're more efficient than of conventional energies. They don't produce pollutants. As you saw there, water is being produced. No moving parts, they're likely to last longer and require less maintenance, and they're more reliable than conventional energies. But there are some disadvantages. You've got to have a continuous supply of hydrogen. Storage of hydrogen needs to be under pressure, and of course, hydrogen gas is very explosive. You know that from the squeaky pop test, for example. And hydrogen is produced from natural gas, which is a finite resource. It's actually a fuel that's being used that we don't have unlimited access to.